discussion today, conversation that goes on between some scholars, some of whom you know, many of whom you know, and some maybe you don't, but you need to, because they're all participants in this conversation, have been for a number of years. We're going to start by introducing Dr. Lynn Coick. Dr. Coick, if you would come, if you would welcome her today. She was my former boss, my former boss at Wheaton College, but now she has uh, gone up a little higher, at least in elevation, uh, to Denver Seminary. She's the provost there, dean, also professor of New Testament. Uh, she, at, at Wheaton College, you were there 17 years, 18, 18 years, 18 years at Wheaton College. Before that, she taught uh, in, in Kenya, at a, a theological college in Kenya, and her husband, Jim, who is around here somewhere, uh, we're, you guys were together over there, and we're so glad that Jim could be, be with us today. Um, she has a B.A. in Bible and Religion from Messiah College. She did her Ph.D. with Bob Kraft at the University of Pennsylvania, and uh, she is the author of a number of commentaries on New Testament books, books of Paul, including Philippians and Ephesians and Romans. I didn't know about the Romans book. That's so. It's a short, it's a very short book, she says. Now, the book that I think is, I'm really excited about is a book that she uh, did a few years ago with Amy Brown Hughes. Um, it's called Christian Women in the Patristic World. If you don't know that book, you need to know that book. The subtitle is Their Influence, that is the Christian Women, Their Influence, Authority, Legacy in the 2nd through the 5th Centuries, Baker Academic 2017. It's a fairly recent book. But it's a book you need to know. She also uh, co-authored a book that I have used for about seven years in New Testament studies, uh, The New Testament in Antiquity, a survey of the New Testament within the cultural context. So anyway, we're so glad. She's a friend of the library. She's been here to lecture. I don't remember which year it was. Do you remember what year? No, I can't off the top of my it's, head. It's in the library. I should yeah. have looked on the yeah. way over. 2015, 2015 was her first introduction. Our second guest today on the panel is Dr. Benjamin Blackwell. Dr. Blackwell, if you would take, please welcome him today. He's an associate professor at Houston Baptist University. I might have had a little bit of something to do with the fact that you're here no. in Houston, and I want to apologize for that. So I, no, I'm really happy about that. He's been a good friend for a number of years. Uh, he, he, uh, in his first life, he was an accountant, and then he, he fell asleep and, and had a dream that he's made far too much money in this world, and he needed to take a vow of poverty. Yeah. So he became a professor. He is an associate professor today in Christian theology and also New Testament as well, and he's well known in those circles. Um, he did a Ph.D. at the University of Durham uh, after studying in Arkansas. He had a couple of degrees from Wachita yep. and then one from uh, Henderson State. That's right. Interstate University. So anyway, we're glad. He has written a wonderful book called Christosis, Engaging Paul's Soteriology with His Patristic Interpreters. He's also uh, written books, uh, co-authored books, Reading Mark in Context, Reading Romans in Context. Apparently there are people here that, thinks, that think reading the Bible in context makes sense. So that's always a good thing. But he's a little bit later. I'm going to ask him to describe a little bit uh, in our conversation about what Christosis is. And that might help our conversation go along. Now this lecture weekend and this panel discussion is made possible because of a partnership that the Lanier Theological Library has uh, with uh, Baylor University, particularly uh, G George W. Truett Theological Seminary. And we're really grateful now to be able to welcome their dean, Dr. Todd Still. Dr. Still, please thank and welcome him today. Now, this is so much I could not memorize it, so I have to read it. He is the Charles J. and Eleanor McLaren Delancey Dean and the William N. Henson Professor of Christian Scriptures at the George W. Truett Theological Seminary at Bell University. Is that correct? <laughs> Something like that. Something <laughs> like that. It's, it, it makes for a big business card. It's the size, size of a 5 by 7 
uh, picture. The Master of Divinity at, uh, at, at, Houston, uh, excuse me, at <laughs> Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, did his PhD at the University of Glasgow. He's the author of a book called Conflict in Thessalonica. He also, with Bruce Longenecker, has written a book entitled Thinking Through Paul. He's done commentaries uh, in Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon and such. Written 50 articles for prestigious publications, many of which we have here, right here in the library. Um, thank you, Dr. Still, for making this week possible with George W. Truett Theological Seminary. Our guest today, special guest, and also in our lecture tomorrow night at 7 p.m. right here in the Stone Chapel is Dr. Scott McKnight. Scott, if you would, come, please join us. Now, now, now Scott is, is the Julius R. Manti Chair of New Testament at Northern Seminary. Is that right? And your boss is here, Dr. Bill Shield. Where is Dr. Shield? Right over here. His boss, is, he's here to take notes. on. Uh, this is a part of your annual assessment, I think, something like that. Uh, he did a master's degree at, at, at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in Chicago. And by the way, thank you for bringing some Chicago weather with you. Uh, we get tired of 70-degree days, don't we, here? And don't we get tired? We like some of the cold, rainy, rainy stuff. He did a Ph.D. at the University of Nottingham, which is, in fact, 18 miles from the Sherwood Forest. I looked that up. That's actually true. It's a fact, so you can trust it. He is, he's well known uh, as a lecturer, as a writer, as a pastor, as a theologian, as a churchman, church person. Is that better? Church person. And has done just a great deal to help promote uh, the preaching and teaching of the gospel. I used his book last year at Wheaton College called The King Jesus Gospel. It's a great book. And I would commend that to you. Now, he has written, and we have in the library, according to Sharon, 41 books that he has authored, co-authored, edited. Uh, and so he's got a lot of signing to do while he is here. So, Scott, we, we're really pleased that you're here. The book that we're talking about today in particular is the book called Reading Romans Backwards. Okay, that's the book where you'll have a chance to put your hands on a copy uh, tomorrow evening. So he's a little bit of high church. He's a little bit of low church. He's a lot of Chicago Cubs. So anyway, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. Would you greet all of our panelists today? <laughs> Excited to be a part of the conversation. Now, the, I always ask this as a first question. It's a question I've, I've asked and, and told students that they should approach books this way. That every good book, every important book, has a big idea. We call that a thesis. It's something you put forward as an idea, and then you, in a sense, argue for that, and you try to persuade your audience. So I'm going to begin by asking Scott what might be a, an obvious question. What's the big idea of your book, Reading Romans Backwards? Well, David, thanks for this invitation, and Todd... And Mark, who's not here, who I, someday I hope to meet, yeah. but for everyone to be here, um, it's, uh, it's quite a place to be in, in this chapel to talk about Romans. The big idea of this book um, is that if we think more carefully about the chapters we don't read in Romans, chapters 12 to 16, because we're worn out. By the time we get through chapter 8, and we're irritated by the time we get into 9 through 11, so we forget 12 to 16 to go to Galatians. Uh, I believe uh, that if we pay more attention to chapters 12 through 16, the letter that Paul wrote to the Roman house churches ceases becoming um, an abstract theoretical text about systematic theology and becomes very quickly pastoral ecclesial theology for a given audience in Rome. Uh, not to say that there aren't propositions theologically in the book of Romans that have to be considered. I mean, come on, you'd be fooled to say that. But I do think if we start paying attention to the end of Romans more carefully, it renovates how we read the earlier chapters. And in particular, um, there are 
there are two chapters, chapters 14 and 15, which all of a sudden weighs into a debate, evidently, a division uh, that I call a division about privilege and power between the weak and the strong, both of whom believe they were the privileged, the weak think they had the Bible on their side, and the strong thought they had Rome on their side, or status in society, and they're having a hard time getting together as brothers and sisters in Christ, as siblings, and being able to do so without getting into verbal arguments. So I think that the theme of the Book of Romans should be welcome one another, sit with one another at the table. And the theology of Romans 1 through 8 is actually a practical theology designed to get these people to be able to live together in unity. For Christians who are weak, Christians who are strong, and these terms have to be spelled out, obviously. These Christians should be able to get together as siblings in Christ and treat one another as siblings and not turn it into a theological battle about who has the most privilege and power in the church. Okay? Let's, let's take, let me press a little, bit, a little bit further. Your subtitle is A Gospel of Peace in the Midst of Empire. How does empire figure into all that? The way of Rome is the way of empire. And I think the way of empire, this, this, this is a big question, you know, uh, David, this is outside my jurisdiction. <laughs> um, empire is connected to power, prestige, status. The cursus honorum, the Latin expression for the typical Roman male who had some opportunity in society to be able to climb the social ladder and end up um, in a, uh, as a monument on the central streets of one's location. So for instance, in Rhodes, the, uh, the old town of Rhodes in the first century had 3,000 monuments. And with the old Chrysostom came and gave a lecture to the Rhodians, he invaded and ridiculed their monument culture of honoring one another because they no longer had the money to build new monuments and were scraping off names of the old people and writing in new names. And he says they don't even look like one another. <laughs> so that's the culture of Rome. It's the culture of the empire. It's the culture of Greece. And Paul thinks that this kind of culture has begun to influence his mission churches, say in Ephesus, Corinth, probably Thessaloniki, and, and Rome. And Paul writes out of that experience to Rome, uh, to the house churches in Rome, and say, we, we will not have it this way in the church. So I think the way of empire is a, is a uh, worldview, a way of propping up a kind of behavior that was beginning to impact the way the believers of Rome were beginning to, uh, were relating to one another. Lynn, we, we're talking about the book of Romans, which is the sixth book of the New Testament, right? If I'm counting right. Um, it's called and designated a helped briefa, a major letter. How did it get that designation, that particular designation? Yeah, I think that uh, one, of, one is its size. Paul develops his argument with a lot of detail. I think probably secondly, Paul engages with the Hebrew scripture, with the Bible, the time quite extensively. And so I think that the letter itself, I think, was seen by the church as a, as a way to understand what they're inheriting um, as, as um, followers of, of the covenant. So I would say probably those two uh, reasons. Okay, anybody want to add to that at all? Feel free, by the way, at any point to jump into the conversation. Just, but uh, I guess if you're going to use that lang language, how brief, uh, that's German. You did Oh yeah, that, sorry. Right? So that's, uh, for, uh, but it's a favorite of uh, the Reformation, right? Martin Luther loved Romans as a, uh, we all should, but uh, in that sense, it, it holds that center, central doctrine of justification by faith. And so that's, uh, along with Galatians, right, stands at kind of the, the pillars on which the Reformation was argued. 
and therefore set forward of, uh, we might use the language of a canon within a canon, that uh, within the canon of scripture, it's the one that stands at the forefront. Uh, Certain major letters are yep. more important than others then? Yep. Okay. Or have been deemed more important through history yes. and, and use and maybe uh, neglect in some cases. But Scott's argument is that we ought to really begin at the back of the book. By the way, I didn't read your book backwards. <laughs> I hope that's okay. I do. I do that. Do you? Do you? Oh yeah. Do you do yeah. That? Go to the you end to see conclusion. who really killed the guy before you. Have right, to spend and then you go the back. Always, always read yeah. the conclusions first. Yeah. I'll read right. the conclusion first. But I didn't do that with you. I read it front to back, and you do build the argument, and uh, and I'm just wondering how persuasive each of the panelists felt like you were, in in that argument. So if. Um, I'm convinced. You're convinced. <laughs> okay, let, let, on a Likert scale, let's do persuaded, almost persuaded, if I can use that, and not persuaded at all. Todd? I was deeply appreciative. <laughs> That's not um, one of the options. <laughs> uh, what, what Scott's volume is able to accomplish is what we have said to our students um, is a truism. Namely, that Paul wrote uh, particular letters to particular people at particular points in times regarding particular things. Paul was a pastoral theologian. He was not an armchair theologian. He doesn't uh, sit down one day and decide, I'm going to uh, codify all I've thought regarding justification or righteousness or sanctification. And Scott rightly argues that this is the way that Romans has sometimes been read, uh, not with ill intent, uh, but arguably sometimes to ill effect. And so what Scott helps us do persuasively is to say, um, let's get on the ground uh, in Roman house churches. And a portal to do that is let's start at the end. And so uh, instead of starting at the beginning, Scott says, what if, so it's a thought experiment. What if we were to start where the so-called practical or the exhortative uh, portions of Romans are, what might this book look like? And if we can crack that nut, then might the rest of the volume come into clearer focus. And the proof of the tasting is in the eating. And here's the thing. When you taste and see what Romans is, having read re reading Romans backwards, it tastes all the better. Lynn, persuaded, almost persuaded, not persuaded at all. And I, I'm very persuaded. Um, in fact, I uh, teach Romans the way that he writes it here. We do actually start at the back. I find that that helps the students uh, appreciate the argument that I hope to make. Uh, at the, and then we start at the beginning as uh, in, in chapter one. But I think if the students don't recognize that there were two groups of people within the church, the Jew and the Gentile, who had very different histories, uh, very different realities, very different prejudices, and Scott brings all this out very well, um, and until they recognize that these are real people. This, today's church often approaches Romans as though it is truly just theology way up here. If you start, though, at the end of the letter, you recognize what everybody in the first century already knew, is that you have to do your faith. Everybody already knew that. That's what they expected. It was a way of life. And so... Because we forget that, we have to start at the end of the letter. But they could start at the beginning of the letter because they already assumed what we have forgotten. So that, so I'm very persuaded with how um, Scott sets it up because I think it helps us get into those sandals of the first century. Benjamin, same. Yeah. Uh, somewhere between convinced and uh, almost convinced. You know, it's uh, in that sense, I think I'm on a journey here. And I, maybe to give some history, uh, you know, the tradition I came out of 
viewed Romans very much as that systematic theology, that it's giving these universal ideas. And even um, I wrote an article, I guess about 10 years ago, on glory in Romans. And it was very much the arc of from creation to new creation. So Adam to Christ. And I think the what's important within that arc is that there's this arc of Israel's heritage and that Jesus as, you know, the Davidic Messiah. So again, I'll uh, put a plug in for the King Jesus gospel. I think that's very central to understanding that, that covenantal progression that, that undergirds Paul's wider theology. And so within that, uh, that story of, it, it's not even just that, that universal arc there, but it's the, the people of the church that lives within that arc and within those broader narratives. And so it's these nested dolls, we might say, um, within that. And I think that's the, uh, so there are elements of the argument that I might uh, want to see, see those overlapping a little bit more. So it's not just focused on one element, you know, it's not just five to eight that captures that universal element, but that all of these are kind of going on at the same time. Uh, but at the same, I think it is quite important that we, uh, and, and it struck me, I'm teaching Romans in January, and uh, I've already uh, crafted my <laughs> you know, instructions for the students to go back and, and follow this model. So I guess the proof is in the pudding if it's... Uh, cool. That's cool. Uh, so the, you, you'll have a report in yes. the spring, right? Yes. One way or the other. All right, so let me, yeah, let me Scott, yeah. give one word of defense for the mm. author of the book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have been asked at times by uh, well-meaning people, um, why would you begin at the end? The, the readers didn't begin at the end. Well, my father was an English teacher, and he would, have, he, find, he would have found this. He died in the spring, but he would have found this abhorrable, uh, abhorrent to begin a book at the end. Uh, but uh, what I want to contend is the realities of chapters 14 to 15, and not just there. 12, 13 has stuff as well, um, and 15 some uh, later in the letter, uh, especially chapter 16. When uh, they knew that as their reality, that was the world in which they lived. So when Paul kicks off his, his argument in 118, uh, they are beginning to hear it as weak and strong, whatever. They hear this already. And they know he's, I think some of them know he's out to get them. And, and they're feeling the pressure of that. So it is true uh, that we begin at the end, but it's the end that is the reality of the readers themselves is what I'm trying to construct. And, and, and this is the challenge of reading other people's mail, right? Yes, in yes. A sense. Uh, I've heard John Walton say that this, th these books are not written to us, but they are written for us. Mm -hmm. So, so we, we weren't the first people in mind when Paul is writing this letter and Tertius is taking it down and before and, it's being sent. And Phoebe is reading it. And I think that's yeah. the other yeah. wonderful yeah. thing yeah. That, yep, yep. that uh, Scott does is he reminds us page after page how this was delivered orally to the congregation so that there is uh, Phoebe uh, okay. as, as uh, Paul well, said. Well, unpack so. that a little bit. Who is Phoebe and how did she get this amazing task of being the courier and the presenter of this letter? I think she was a trusted co-worker of Paul who had the uh, education and the financial resources to be able to take this letter to Rome um, and then to, to read it. Uh, the, one of the things that, that's, and not just read it, but having sat with Paul and understood what his argument is, then as she reads it, she'll also be able to answer the questions that might emerge, assuming that she and Paul had, had talked about those. Or she would just text him with questions that they hadn't <laughs> gone through. Yeah, but I think that's the other point of all of this is that it was an, a, an auditory experience. They weren't actually reading it and rereading it and underlining and all that. They were listening. And what Scott also does is he, he says, you know, so Phoebe will look on this to those the weak and be talking to them talk to the strong. And so it helps us enter in again to that first century world, that first century church that received this letter and could hear it. And oftentimes when we hear something, we are convicted in ways that if we're just reading it along, maybe we don't. But when we hear it spoken to us, there's a deep conviction. I think uh, Scott brings that out well. So Phoebe has a really key yes. part in getting this. Now, Scott, let's
Let's press a little further. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the weak and the strong. Did the weak like being called weak? And, and give I, us a little I bit wanted of a to say a little bit about performance, but I'll, I'll go. Okay. okay, no, go ahead. Go okay. Ahead. Um, wrong, these New Testament books for us are seen as texts designed for sermons. You know, they really are. Or devotional reading. This was a letter Paul wrote uh, to specific churches in Rome, and he enlisted Phoebe as the letter courier, I think almost certainly the letter reader. I'm more confident some days than others, but today I'm very confident because <laughs> I have you by my there side. There you go. Okay. That's it. Uh, Lynn can be Phoebe. And she would have been taught how to read this letter. Have you ever read Romans aloud at one time? That's tough. It's a long letter. It's 90 minutes. And that's if you don't pause. But when she asks dozens of questions in chapters 2 through 4 and chapters 9 through 10 into chapter 11, when she asked those questions, she didn't ask them and then immediately answer them. She probably paused. And when you pause that many times, you're not even a good lawyer. You know, you're right now making people feel very uncomfortable. And she did this over and over in this letter to try to get people to respond. Furthermore, people didn't sit there like Anglicans <laughs> with Mona Lisa smiles. They were first century Pentecostals who, who were oohing and on. And and <laughs> amen and, and dilly dilly. <laughs> they were Bud Light type people, you can tell. At least the poor were. And they, they would have responded. And there's no reason to think that she didn't ad lib as she read this letter. And didn't stop and say, you get what I'm saying? And if they don't, to clarify. Because nobody reads Romans 7 without questions and having to clarify. And their first question was, who was I? Who was the ego of Romans 7? Who knows what she said? Maybe she lowered her voice a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so on the performance side, I think we need to take this far more seriously. I'll talk a little bit more about this tomorrow night. Now the weak and now the, the Yeah, give us a profile of who the weak are, who the strong are. And, and that language seems to be offensive. To some, right? Why, why call people the weak? And Paul is going to identify with the strong, right? Well, he, he says we, but you know, what, what does we mean to Paul? Uh, Sometimes, all right, I, I don't know that he wants to completely say he's one of the strong, but he identifies with some of the things the strong believe. Uh, in general, the big picture is the weak, um, and the, one of the, the most important expression for this to me is found in Romans 15 when Paul compares the dunatoi with the adunatoi. And this is the strong and the weak, but this language is the language of social status. The dunatoi are the powerful, and the adunatoi are the powerless. So the weak and the strong has a social dynamic to it of those with status in the Roman Empire, or at least in this group of people in the empire, and those without status. I, I believe the weak are Jewish believers who believe the Torah has to be observed because they are Bible-believing Jewish believers. This is what the Bible says. You're not supposed to eat pork. Can you exegete that text in a way where it doesn't mean that? That sort of thing. So I believe that they are Jewish believers and probably struggling to find kosher food. And so maybe Robert Jewett is right when he says that all they can find is leafy vegetables, uh, is how he translates. Um, uh, so, and, and they are imposing on their fellow believers their belief that they ought to be following all of Scripture and not just the New Testament. Uh, and, and the strong um, obviously believe in unhitching with Andy Stanley, uh, that they should unhitch the Old Testament from the New. And, and Paul is pressing into this situation where there's a social dynamic that's ethnic, it's social, 
it's theological, it's exegetical, and it's intolerant. And both sides mirror one another. The strong are socially high status. They don't believe that you should follow the Torah. Uh, they have a circle of friends who all operate this way. They have the power to make things happen. And they are at odds with one another. So it becomes a battle of privilege. I've been in these settings in American churches this week, every week, right? But don't be Anglicans on me, please. All right? And that is, right now we are battling over who has the best vision, who are the most privileged, who is going to gain the power. No letter uh, that I know of Paul's is quite as forceful on this very topic of privilege and power as the letter of Romans. And I, and I think it's pretty honest to say that very few people pay attention to this because they wear out by the time they get to chapter 14. All right. So by the time you get to chapter 14, these people have already sort of self-identified through the letter. In other words, they know where they stand vis-a-vis -vis what Phoebe is reading to them aloud. You know, Peter Oakes wrote a wonderful book, uh, Reading Romans in Pompeii. I don't know if you read that book. It's really pretty clever. It's not very exciting, but it's a good book. <laughs> um, and he, he asks, uh, he, he goes to a, a, a large villa in Pompeii and says, who was in that house? And if this is a Christian house, household, how would the people in that household have heard this, this letter? So he says, a slave girl, how did she hear this letter? And it's very powerful mirror reading. I think that's what uh, we have to imagine happening in Romans. We, we start out that letter in 118 through 32, which is a typical, you know, God hates sinners, the wrath of God poured out on man uh, for sinfulness. And I'm asking the question, okay, that's fine. Uh, how did the weak hear that? I think they heard that and went, that's right. Good for you, Paul. Tell them what they need to hear. Yeah. And I think they're happy with that, that part of the letter. So I want to imagine with the, with the audience how they would have heard. So I think they may have self-identified and may very well have asked Phoebe some questions. I'd like to think they did. And Phoebe would have said, yeah, that, this one's for you. Pay attention. So how many times did she perform this particular letter? Well, they didn't all meet in the, in the uh, Circus Maximus or anything like that, you know? They didn't all meet together. Uh, they didn't have that kind of access. If we, if we say they lived in a domus or a house, uh, 40, 50 people could fit maybe, unless it's really big, then maybe we get 65, something like that. Um, if they're in a tenement, in an insulae, um, 20, 15, we don't, we're not sure. So um, it is pretty common for people to say that there are in Romans 16, 3 to 16, indication of five houses, churches there. If that represents all of the house churches in Rome, then I would say she probably had to perform this letter at least five times. So she walks into the, the house church, sometimes uh, 25, more like an apartment building kind of place, right? Or small Atrium group. or young, Atrium. small group. So she walks in there. And how does she know who's the weak and who's the strong? So that when Lynn was saying she turns to this group and turns to that group, they don't have hats that say weak, strong. How did Lynn Well, how it, was, it was very easy. They, you, all you have to do is have shrimp hors d'oeuvres and pass them around <laughs> and see who <laughs> takes some and who doesn't. Isn't that fair? Yeah. No. Yeah. I, okay. I, um, I think that this would be known socially and culturally immediately by, by her in seeing people. She, she, could, she could see that. There was something visual. Names. She could t okay. common, common vocabulary. Okay. Conversation. I, yeah, and I don't think she just shows up and, okay, we're getting ready to start now, and then just reads. This is part of the community that she's welcomed into. She, they want to know about her, and she wants to get to know them. And so maybe it's after a couple of days she now starts reading it. I mean, hospitality, as you well know, is such an important uh, component of life at this time. And so 
they, they would have gotten to know her and then, and she would have gotten to know them. Todd, there's yeah. conflict in Thessalonica. Yes. You're writing about that. <laughs> Is it anything to do with, with what we're talking about here? Or are the conflicts in Thessalonica something totally different than what's yeah. happening in Rome? So in uh, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, you have evidence that uh, Christ followers are receiving affliction at the hands of outsiders. Uh, they are experiencing what Paul calls slipsis. Here, uh, it could be that uh, Christ followers, believers, are experiencing opposition at the hands of those outside Romans 8 might lean in that direction from 835 forward. So also there is some difficulty that we're able to sense at 13, 1 to 7. Uh, but the conflict that exists in Rome seems to be more internal amongst believers than external uh, amongst uh, uh, unbelievers and the ones that Paul can sometimes call the hoi exoi, the, the, the ones outside. I, I might just drop this footnote, David. It, it may well be that uh, one of the social dynamics ongoing here is that the weak and the strong are actually not worshiping together. They may well find themselves in cells, in groups, separated one from another. Uh, so it could well be that one reading of the letter is a reading of the letter to the weak. Uh, one reading of the letter is a reading of the letter to the strong. It is fascinating that at the outset of the letter, Paul doesn't say to the church in Rome. Rather, he says to all in Rome who are loved by God, called to be uh, the holy ones. So I gather that Paul's vision, uh, where there is neither Jew or Greek, is coming into a collision course right here in the capital city. And he would like to see uh, this vision come uh, to fruition. But there is plenty of friction, and I'm not so sure that their lives together are as uh, uh, unified as Paul wants. In fact, it's clearly not. And so that being said, there's clearly some kind of uh, ongoing social interaction. Otherwise, 14.1 through 15.6 makes no sense at all. Yeah. Scott, what do you think of that, that they might well, be meeting separately? Well, I mean, Romans 14.1 is... Uh, uh, welcome one another without argumentation. I can be read together as, uh, you know, depending on how you're going to play with errors, tense, and imperatives, is that this could be uh, a command uh, to do something that they haven't been doing. Yeah. And now when you're, you know, it's sort of like, eat together and you're going to like it. <laughs> um, it it's, could be that, or it could be, Welcome one another, but now quit fighting about it. You're welcoming one another already. You're eating with one another, but you turn it into an occasion for, for argument. So I've, what Todd just said there to me has been one of the pestering questions I've had about Romans for a long time is I don't know if they're meeting together or not. I, just, I, I don't know that the letter is clear enough for us to know that. And I, I do think that we tend to read into imperatives like Romans 14, 1, what, what we think is going on rather than what the text actually yeah. says. So. Yeah. It may be a mixture of both. Yeah. 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 My first class, I think, that I ever had in Romans, uh, I was told that the thesis of Romans is Romans 1, 16 and 17. Let me read that really quickly. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, that is in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed through faith, for faith, as it is written, he who through faith is righteous. It, it, sorry, <laughs> let me go back. He who through faith is righteous shall live. Now that's the Revised Standard Translation. Is, is that still a good way of thinking about the thesis of the book based upon this, Ben? If, if you take Scott's theory about reading this book backwards and starting at chapter 12 and pressing into 14 and 15 and these two social groups, hmm. does that still work as kind of a, a thesis statement for the book? The righteousness of God, the gospel, faith, living through faith? 
Yeah, I think this is uh, important. I mean, it's um, Daniel Kirk has written a book on Romans uh, a decade or so ago to where he argued that uh, verses 3 and 4 actually are the thesis. And I, we uh, were covering this in class on Monday night, and I'm sorry about that. And um, I, I think it's an important thing to bring these together is that there's this gospel of God that Paul is preaching, right, that was promised beforehand through his prophet prophets and the Holy Scriptures, the gospel concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by resurrection from the dead. This is Jesus Christ, our Lord. And it's that sense that Christ is this revelation of God, I think is quite important for, it's not some um, just abstract quality that's revealed or even just our salvation that's revealed there, but it's that Jesus Christ is dead and raised and, and particularly Jesus, the Christ. Uh, it's, uh, I always say this, it's not Joseph and Mary Christ that had a little baby Jesus Christ. It's uh, a title, not a name. And so in that sense, he's the Messiah that is the fulfillment of these promises beforehand. So it's in continuity with what God had promised before even if it's uh, quite different than what they expected. And so in that sense, I think it is quite important that what Paul says there is that it is this power of God for salvation. But I think what happens, usually happens, is that, that universalizing effect. Of course, it's for everybody. And so we just take to the Jew first and then to the Gentile as it's for everybody. And I think what uh, this book does in a masterful way is forces us to think, no, why did Paul say that? He could have said everybody. And so in that sense that it is, like there's the, not just promise beforehand, but also it's part of this uh, specific narrative there. I've, I've got an alternate thesis about what uh, the one righteous by faith will live will mean, but I'll, okay. I'll leave that. Uh, I won't okay. drone on here. So You, you don't want to... Well, I'm, I'm happy to put it in there. I'll sell my, uh, you know, give you what I'm selling. I think that's actually what Paul is doing in Romans 1 to 8. Uh, and so uh, righteousness by faith is the uh, important to respond to this problem of works of the law that are being misappropriated. Uh, but the, the promise that the one who is righteous by faith will live is the focus of 5 to 8. And so it's not yeah. that Paul is talking about justification in 1 to 4 and then sanctification in five to eight, but he's actually extending the justification argument that the righteous one by faith will live. And so if you look at the life language. Um, the life in the spirit then. Yeah, just life in general through Christ. And so in that sense that uh, Scott brings out this point that forgiveness is usually what we associate with righteousness or justification. And only in the, in the main letters does Paul associate righteousness and forgiveness maybe once or twice. Uh, but if you look throughout uh, Romans, there's about a dozen times where he associates righteousness and life. And so it's part of that, uh, his goal actually is much more transformative. It's speaking, leading into this life of faith that you live out. So justification is not some getting in fire insurance deal. And then we hope that you uh, live a life of uh, obedience to Christ, but it's actually that which gives you, uh, that's God's new creation activity to give life to those so who are justified. what does righteousness then mean to the weak, Scott, and righteousness to the strong? In other words, um, are they hearing that language differently? Are they hearing the language of faith differently? Um, first of all, I want to say I don't know why we have to have a thesis verse in a letter. Yeah. Some days I think other, I think in the middle of five through eight, one through 116 to 17 is no longer operative. Another verse, 512, 5, 1. Those are pretty cool too. And 14, 1 is pretty cool. 12, 1 to 2 is pretty cool. So I just saw a book uh, that argues that 12, 1 to 2 is the thesis statement of Romans. So I think that we're, uh, we're creating our own problem, and uh, it's not one that Paul would recognize. I think if you said, what's the most important line in the letter? Paul would say, yeah, I, I wrote a lot of good lines in that letter. You <laughs> ought to pay attention to them. Okay. Righteousness. Oh, my. That's my microphone. There we go. There we go. All right. The, um, this is a term that is... <clears throat> 
deeply disputed among New Testament scholars. And I don't know that there's ever going to be a resolution that everybody agrees with. So I, I, will, I, I believe that righteousness as a, as a Hebrew term, tzedek, refers to behaviors that conform to Torah. So a tzedek, a righteous person, a tzaddik, is someone whose behavior conforms to the standard of God in Torah. All right. I think we have to start there. If we don't start there, I think we get lost in theological disputations that have lost contact with the original context of, of, of a Jewish letter. At the same time, uh, I think that New Testament and Old Testament scholars have proven pretty clearly that Sedek and Nikaios, et cetera, these Greek words and Hebrew words, refers to the act of God of making things right. So it's sort of like God's saving action that, uh, I think Tom Wright used to say this all the time, and it was cool because it was uh, non-American English, put the world to rights. And so everybody was saying this uh, in imitation of Tom. Um, but so righteousness is an act of God, and it's also an attribute of God, and it's also the behavior of humans who conform to the will of God. Yosef, Joseph, the uh, husband of Mary, can be called a dikaios, someone who's righteous because he is Torah observant. I don't believe this, so this, this is where I'm going. I don't believe that you could ever say for a Jew that righteousness could ever be limited strictly to a forensic standing before God. It is always going to be an act of God that, is, that makes people right, that will make the world right, and that will turn these people toward righteousness in their behavior so it's transformative. So the weak, the weak would have had a strong emphasis on Torah observance as manifestation of righteousness. And I like to say this uh, because it's true. And that is, they had the Bible on their side. This is an important argument for first century Jewish Christians. How can you get rid of these things in the Bible? What does that mean? And I think the strong, uh, I don't know who all the strong are, but I think they would have had some nervousness about anything that conveyed too much Jewishness and too much Torah observance connected to righteousness. And maybe dikaiasune would not have been so much characteristic of their Christian vocabulary as it would have been something that they thought described the way the Roman Empire uh, is exacting justicia or dikaios justice in the world. Yeah. But and when you when you talk about Torah, um, some of the things I think that you uh, bring out are, are the different ways in which that word can be understood. So Paul would have and. And the Gentiles, I think, would have agreed. We have to live moral lives as, as expressed by the patriarchs and the, the teaching of the prophets and, and the Ten Commandments and that sort of thing. There are other aspects of being a Jew at this time, such as circumcision, not eating shrimp, resting on Shabbat, that distinguish who a Jew is from who a Gentile is, that it's that component of things that that Paul uh, is, is especially addressing, that the Gentiles don't, they, they don't want to throw out the whole of the Old Testament, all of it, because it's God's word uh, to them, God's promises to them. But it's, it's the having to become a Jew, having to be circumcised, that, that Paul will be pushing against. I think that's what you bring yeah. out. I, I think we, uh, we, we need to see Torah observance in first century categories in sociological and social uh, dynamic terms. And that is, um, when a Jew observed Shabbat, they didn't just follow the law. They identified who they were. They lived the fullness of the, of the Jewish life by doing this. So there is, um, so I, I say this all the time in my classes, uh, and that is, 
I can look at the translation that you bring into my class and I can tell you what group you belong to. <laughs> you know, uh, NRSV students, NIV students, ESV students. I'm nervous about ESV students. <laughs> All right. So they, these translations are tribal. And for them, it's not a conscious behavior, but it expresses an identity with a group. And I think that's what uh, righteousness would have meant to these groups, is it would have expressed their connection symbolically to a group and it formed part of their identity. Is that? Yeah, I, I think that's a lot of it. The, um, David, when you mentioned uh, that Chapter 1, verse 16, I'm not ashamed right, of the gospel. Yeah. Uh, I think, it, it, even though it may not be the best verse or the summary verse of the letter, that word ashamed, I think, uh, should be elevated a little bit more, especially in the conversation about having privilege and power. Yeah. Because what Paul is saying in that I'm not ashamed is he is bringing to the, to the surface what everyone doesn't want, which is I don't want to be ashamed. I don't want to give up my privilege. I don't want to release my power. And Paul, at the very beginning, putting himself, testifying to them, I'm not ashamed. Yeah. Very beginning. Yeah. Now, there's a phrase in there I want us to, to think a little bit about, and it's, it's this phrase sometimes translated from faith to faith, right? Ek pistios, eis piston, from faith to faith. Translations have a, have a dickens of a time trying to get that right, what that means. Todd, what are we to make of that? When uh, I'll let I'll let you solve this and tell us, are you an ESV man? By the way, I'm, no, just, sir. I'm just kidding. Uh, you, don't, you don't have to answer that. For in it, that is in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. What does that mean? Because faith clearly means something to each of these groups, right? Yeah. Allegiance. It means trust. It means something. Yeah, so sometimes it's rendered, right, David, from first to last, from beginning to end. I mean, in the midst of Romans, one does see that Paul draws upon Abraham as paradigmatic uh, in faith. And then Paul uh, offers uh, focus upon the faithfulness of Jesus. And Paul senses, states that in Jesus, uh, he is the telos tunamu, tan telon tunamu, the, the, the end of the law, the aim of the law, the goal of the law. So I think that to hearken back to what Ben says, there is in fact this kind of arc, this trajectory traced. And I think that one can see at certain places within Romans that there are those held up uh, along lines of faith, but faith is, uh, faith is the base. Um, this uh, certainly comes out in chapter 10. It's found in various places throughout. So uh, faith then, uh, both ours in Christ and uh, Christ's faithfulness uh, becomes uh, central uh, throughout Romans. Now, that is not uh, anything other than a gloss on uh, what uh, you've asked me to translate, but yeah, that's the way yeah. I see it operating yeah. well, sometimes uh, within the larger just, economy. We all know, of the I mean, you just can't take words and, put, and, yeah. and, and substitute them from yeah. a dictionary into, yeah. there's idiomatic uses, there's yeah. particular usages, and, and, and some of that's here. So, so you would say, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith beginning to end. Yes. And beginning with Abraham's faithfulness, well, certainly Paul lifts Abraham up. Right. Uh, and what about God's faithfulness to the covenant in the beginning? So it starts with God? Sure. Going back to what? Sure. Okay. Yeah, and then uh, God has revealed God's self. Uh, Paul would say uh, fully and finally uh, in the person of Christ. And this takes us back then to the verses that Ben has already uh, highlighted for us, uh, 1, 3, and 4. Okay. Any other comment? From faith to faith. Ek pistios, ace piston. When? No, I'm just, I could just read from page 98 to 99 where he... <laughs> oh, you mean he's already done it. Okay. <laughs> well, right, go get the book. I, I think I, I this this was our hours of an hours to precipitate this paragraph. Mm -hmm. And uh, because there's so much scholarship on this, 
And I, I think I would say at the end, yeah, uh, probably all those things because we don't really know. And it's not very easy for New Testament professors to admit that they don't know something. Especially, <laughs> look, it's what, how more common words can you get? Ekpistos, ace piston. I mean, it gets, can't get any easier. I mean, first year first students year can student, translate yes, that. Right, right. Yes. All right. But what does it mean from faith to faith? And I chart out, I think what I tried to, I tried to precipitate here are almost all the options, and then uh, we're done. <laughs> because I, they're almost all, every one of them, as you listen to it, you go, I can believe that. And it all makes sense in Romans. It's a rich expression that is, I think we would say, underdetermined. Hmm. So therefore, we are going to live with we a little to, bit of that. We get to choose what we want to believe on that, don't we? That's let's go we to the lightning round. We got, I got several things here I want to do. Uh, one minute. Let's take one minute to do this. Liam, start with you. Priscilla and Aquila. Who are they? Why is it important? Priscilla and Aquila are uh, a couple who, like Paul, had a, a similar job and uh, and. Paul lived with them, and uh, they, they worked well together. They became co-workers, and they continued the, um, the teaching of the gospel even when Paul wasn't, wasn't around. Okay. Did, do you want me to say no. more? No, no. This that's, is lightning. That's, that's good. It's lightning round. <laughs> You've got to be quick. Okay, Scott, we'll give you two minutes on this one. <laughs> the eye passages. Wow. The, oh, <laughs> the eye passages in Romans 7. Okay. Two minutes. No. Um, all right. The, this has been a, a major theological uh, debate for me as I've read Romans over the years. It is typical for many to see this as the egocentric push of narcissistic humans trying to justify their way before God by obeying law or doing things that would merit redemption. But um, when I was a very young professor, I think it was in my first year, that Doug Moo was beginning his commentary on Romans, which was originally for Moody Press, and the commentary series was canceled, and it was picked up by uh, Erdman's. Um, Doug Moo uh, was arguing that it was the story of Israel. And I remember thinking, whoa, that ego is the story of Israel. That fits for the way I read Galatians chapter 2, verses 15 to 21. So I just stored it in the back of my brain. And since then, I mean, uh, Werner Kummel and all these people have written on Ego in Romans 7. I, I believe that uh, there, is a, there is a forcefulness about Romans 7 that begins with chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. Is that it? 4? 5? 6? 5? And... Um, where Paul is sorting out the fact that the law had a limited time and a limited purpose until Christ. So, ace telon, tu, nam, uh, uh, tu Christu, that sort of language that we find in Romans 11 seems to be, or 10, uh, seems to be uh, at work here as well. So, it's until Christ, and now, for instance, um, uh, now that the, the, uh, you have been redeemed by Christ, you have participated in Christ. You don't have to follow the law. So the ego is someone, in a some sense, who is not connected to that vision that Paul is trying to establish in 7, 1 through 5. I think, now to get to the point, I think it's the judge of Romans chapter 2 who represents the weak in a single person. It's prosopoeia, it's speech in character, and Paul is trying to show the weak what's going to happen to their life if they try to be uh, try to impose on the strong the law as the way of the Christian behavior. Okay, okay. so I think it's the I think it's the judge as a personification of the weak. If you want more on that, read the book. Here it is. Mm -hmm. That's the way to do it. All right, let's go to Ben. Justification. Justification. Yeah, yeah. One minute. All right. One minute. <laughs> Uh, so I'll, well, I've already given you my uh, two-minute spiel, right, in the sense that I, I think it is a status, right, that God is declaring this, but it's also, I'll stand with uh, 
Martin Luther on this, that it's God's act of new creation as well. And so that it uh, is uh, that life creating reality there that therefore opens up the whole life. And, and therefore, I think it grounds, and that's the Romans 12, 1, 2, right? That you're living sacrifices. I think that life language that, that is at the, the climax or however you want to call Romans 5 to 8 about what is this um, transformation look like it, it, it's what undergirds and founds the whole rest of the letter as well so in that sense you don't kind of have some abstract kind of getting in theology and one to four and then the rest of the letter kind of wanders around about other things that I, I, I do think that it grounds the whole how starts, do you love one another starts in the character of God the person yeah. of God the attribute. Yeah. Yeah. His attribute of God but then it extends because attributes express themselves into changing and transforming the world toward the new creation. Yeah, in that sense that we're, uh, you asked about Christosis, so I'll put in a yep. tagline from my book here <laughs> There as well. you go. Um, that was the next. Uh, if that's the, you know, if we take the death and resurrection of Christ as the center of what the revelation of God's righteousness is, this is where he reveals who he really is by his love, his uh, sacrifice, his work of redemption for, uh, as covenant faithfulness, I guess I would I'd definitely argue that with the righteousness of God that he is, uh, faithful to this covenant, even when we are not, um, then we, to the extent we're justified, would uh, reflect and we would embody the death and resurrection of Christ as well. The, his righteousness looks very much like our righteousness, and so in that sense, we participate in the righteousness of God. So is that a word you made up, Christosis? Uh, yeah, I believe I did. You so. did make that word up. And you can do that as a scholar? I guess so. That's the, uh, it, it's good and bad, but it's so I use the, it's a play, the term Christosis is a play on term from a, a patristic or early Christian uh, doctrine called theosis that we uh, become and we're transformed into the likeness of God. And so Christosis was my turn on that, that uh, we are transformed into the likeness of Christ. This is Romans 8. Right. Yeah, so the whole Chris, the Christo goal of discipleship is to be conformed to the image of, of the Son. Yeah, so the, the language that uh, Scott uses is Christoformity, so we're transformed to that form of Christ, and so it's just a uh, probably too clever by a half degree or whatever, a turn of phrase to, uh, but that's, you know, trading off of that same idea. Romans 16, Todd, what's the significance of it? Well, it's interesting that um, some early editions of Romans excluded uh, chapter 16, so there used to be a discussion among scholars uh, if Romans 16 was even an authentic part of the letter. Some thought that since Paul had yet to go to Rome, he was only to visit Rome en route to Spain, that uh, this was a lost fragment that was actually directed to Ephesus. But Harry Gamble rightly put that thesis to bed and reconnected chapter 16 to the rest of the letter. And when he did so, Romans began to pop because all of a sudden we recognize that this is no disembodied epistle. This is an apostle who has networks that actually emanate to Rome. And Paul is not, in the words of Austin Farrar, a saint cast in cold marble. Rather, Paul is a person who has deep and rich connections that go throughout empire. And so Paul begins to name folks, not only Phoebe, not only Priscilla and Aquila, but also Andronicus and Junia. Andronicus and Junia, prominent among the apostles, perhaps as an apostle. He can talk of Mary, his mother. He can begin to name all of these people and all of a sudden we begin to see that Christianity is not this disembodied theory in the first century, but these folks have names. <laughs> and they're networking. And it makes Without all the, internet. the difference in the world. Yeah. And this is where Scott's thesis really does begin to pay off. Because they have names, because Paul is a pastoral theologian, he actually is not like the visiting preacher who is daring where angels fear to trod. He can, in fact, begin to offer words of admonition. He does so respectfully and politely, compare Galatians, compare Corinthians, 
But nonetheless, he feels as if though part of his apostolic remit is to weigh in here so that the weak and the strong in Rome might instantiate the overall vision of his mission, neither Jew or Greek. So Romans 16, far from being a laundry list of names, inconsequential that you can peacefully pass over when you're proclaiming Romans in your 52-week series, it actually does have to be preached. And you might even want to start there. Start. That would really Ooh. be reading backwards. That would be yeah. backwards. That would be start beyond with six, backwards. Start, start, start with 16. All right, Lynn, mission to Spain. The mission to Spain. Can I, can I say something about yeah, yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. You know, the uh, Peter Lampa wrote an amazing book yeah. on Romans yeah. Yeah. called From yeah. Paul to Valentinus. And this is what German professors get to do is he investigated all the registers of names in the ancient Roman world and inscriptions so that you could categorize these names. And a lot of these names are slaves. So one of the things about them is they're not only real names. The diversity of this right here yeah. Yeah. is there are a lot of slaves. There are seven women, probably. Um, the NRSV has seven. The other translations that don't use the word brothers and sisters uh, just use brothers. If you assume that's males only, then it would be six. But we, have, uh, we seem to have Priscilla and Aquila at the top for a reason. So there's, there's diversity. There's Gentile names. There's Jewish names. So right there is a collage of the diversity of that early Christian assembly. And so I, th I think I'm, I'm with you on that. I thought that was almost a, a written paragraph when you said there, Todd, um, eloquent, um, is that uh, I think those It's being recorded, are, so we'll it, be yes. able to, you'll go, be able to go back go right and write that. that. That would be like without that. edits. Yeah. Okay. So, sorry. Yeah. Lynn, but, no, so, no. So, I, how does the mission to Spain fit into all this, or, or does it? Tell us about the mission to Spain. Just. Right. He hopes that they will support him, that the Roman church will support him as he goes further beyond Rome to expand, um, expand his mission. And, and so he, he is letting them know about his own views, um, trying to form relationships. I think that's helpful also just to recognize that this letter yeah, yeah, is not yeah. a school marm shaking her finger, um, but this, he really does want to, uh, to have them be part of his ministry team and to send him on his way. And so he is uh, trying to build a relationship, including by uh, mentioning those, uh, those names. Um, so I wonder too, if it's taking it up today, if we did start in chapter 16, what might be one of the shocks of, of uh, preaching Romans if you start at 16? I think, um, I think I would have experienced church differently myself. If I knew from the very beginning when I was in high school that so many women were a part of uh, Paul's leadership team, were co-workers with him, were speaking the gospel with him. I'm hearing some amens. Yes, yes. It's a Pentecostal bunch. <laughs> yes. got yeah, that's all right. It's all of us. That would be, uh, that would be kind of, it, it would be different. It would feel different, wouldn't it? It would, it would sound different. It would empower in different ways. So, yeah, I challenge somebody to do it. Maybe me. I, I have a question Maybe here. any of us. Go ahead. Do you, do you think the week gave him a lot of money on his trip to Spain? Or was, the, you know what I'm saying? Like, it does come across when I, after reading this, I thought, it's a, it's a very pointed letter for a long time if you read it this way, right? Because usually we kind of think of it as like, okay, they get a couple, you know, maybe get chapter nine kind of and a little bit of uh, 14, 15 or so. But like if it is the whole letter, does that, I mean, what does that mean as a missionary fundraiser? I mean, I think it reads well, it, re, yeah, read yeah, it I, quite I think differently one of the, one of the more interesting things in Romans 15 uh, is that, Paul is not so sure they're going to take on his, his collection for the saints when he gets to Jerusalem. And he's worried about this. And when you read the book of Acts, uh, I have positive days and negative days on, on reading this, whether they accepted the collection for the saints. It, it never really says they did. It, that they did. So that hesitation in Romans 15 seems 
to me, at least in one reading of the book of Acts, to have come to fruition in the fact that they did not accept that collection because it would mean endorsing his mission that they weren't so keen on. Tell Nor did they help him when he's in prison. Tell us more about this collection, because, because the Jerusalem collection I mean, is something we read about in a couple of different books, right? What is his aim in that? What does he hope to do? There's real poverty back in Jerusalem. So he's trying to alleviate real poverty, but he's also trying to do what else with that? If somebody dumps a boatload of money on you, why would you say, yeah. no, I don't want it? Um, I have this in uh, a little bit in here, and I have it in my new book, Pastor Paul. Um, there's a debate, and I don't, uh, I've taken a position, but only just because I felt like I should, um, is whether Paul uh, collected money his entire mission or he had two different collections. Bruce Longenecker's book is pretty strong that there were two separate collections. I, I think Paul was a, a long-term fundraiser, but I, I think it's open for debate. All right, but he, he has, uh, we have two, two uh, chapters in 2 Corinthians that seem to be obsessed with this collection for the saints. Paul saw and vested in the money given by his Gentile churches, his mission churches, to him for the saints in Jerusalem, he vested in that symbolic significance of the embrace of the mission of God, the mystery that he calls his gospel of preaching to the Gentiles. And he's, he's rightfully nervous about whether the, the party of James or the the uh, conservative, observant Jewish believers of Jerusalem are going to embrace that kind of money because it would mean embracing that mission. Uh, but Paul believed in generosity and he believed that the Gentile believers have a, have a material obligation to Jerusalem because of the spiritual benefits of redemption in the Messiah, Second Corinthians. Furthermore, um, and that's Romans 15, but 2 Corinthians 8 has, what I, in verses 13 to 14, I think one of the most profound statements in the New Testament, it's one of those statements that I don't know what to do with. And Paul says that he wants them to be generous, the Corinthians, so that there might be isotetas, <laughs> isotetes, equality. Whoa, equality. And he wants the Corinthians to be generous with their funds so that their uh, imbalance of bonus goods could be a compensation for the lack of goods for Jerusalem. His model uh, for this is the manna. Now, this becomes even more profound, Exodus 15, is that right? Exodus 15. So this becomes, everybody has what they need, no more than what they need, but everything they need. And Paul uses that as his paradigm for why Gentile churches should support the poor believers of Jerusalem. And so he has a, a belief in the, uh, the ecumenical movement, is that we are all one church. And we have an obligation to take care of the poor in other places if we are wealthy, and someday they may flip and they may be able to support us, but we have an obligation because of Torah, Exodus 15, to become manna-like Christians. Now, if these folks are slaves, by and large, how much are they gonna be able to contribute? Corinth, are you talking about Rome? Well, I'm talking about in Rome, yeah. Todd has a really good answer to that. I, 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 was, thinking, I, was, thinking, I was thinking, I was, I was looking at Todd, because I thought Todd, Todd would be able to get that. That's a softball for Todd. One of the fascinating things to me is that here is a practical problem, uh, impoverished saints in Jerusalem, that Paul as a pastoral theologian now brings to bear his convictional world. Yeah. He, he, yeah. Tur he turns to Christology. Though he was weak, yet he became poor, so that in and through his poverty, you might become rich. Yeah. He turns to his ecclesiology to say, you're... All, all people uh, are, uh, we're bound together. No one is an island. We're all part of the main. And so his, and this is one of the thrusts. I think it's the thrust of Scott's book. 
It's a Christological ecclesiology or ecclesiological Christology. So Paul is saying that whether you give little or whether you give much, at the end of the day, it's meant to redound to the glory of God by, by virtue of the fact that you're yielded one to another. This is how we will know if you are being formed more fully to the image and likeness of Jesus. And, and the Gentiles wouldn't have understood that quite as much as the Jews because Gentiles didn't have a custom of giving alms to the poor because the poor couldn't give you anything back in terms of right. that they couldn't raise a monument for you. They couldn't do anything like that. And so the, this is a very much from Paul's Jewish worldview. Um, it's the commandments. And, the commandments are to, to give, right? It, exactly right, yes. And so I think that that, um, getting back to I'm not ashamed, it's like, uh, okay, I will, I will forego displaying my wealth, which was a, a virtue in, uh, for, in Rome for the Romans there, and instead I'm going to use what little extra I might have and send it somewhere I don't know them. They're never going to honor me with it, and yeah, and... So it, it's, it's quite radical, actually. It's quite radical. Two well, students of John, John Barclay have not brought in the word grace here as well. In 2 <laughs> Corinthians 8 to 9, Paul thinks the grace of God in Christ should precipitate grace in believers to become grace-giving, generous people toward the poor. And uh, no, I can commend no book better than John Barclay's Paul and the Gift. Mm -hmm. Paul and the Gift. I bet you can find it right here at the Linear Library if you need a copy. Yeah, I, I might just say, uh, now that Scott has graciously opened this door, I, I mean, John would talk about the circle of Charis, that uh, Charis commences with God, it's made manifest in Jesus in these... Uh, in, in these outposts of, of, um, of Christ followers in various locations. And, and it, 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 it doesn't short circuit. Uh, it just keeps flowing. Uh, and so as Paul would see the collection, he would be thinking, uh, don't let the grace of God um, be uh, in vain. Uh, continue to lean into it and live it out in tangible kinds of ways. The other thing that I think in uh, John Barclay's book that I appreciated so much was when he talked about the issue of works or mm -hmm. works of the law or that concept. He, he also brought in the idea of worth and one's self-worth mm -hmm. and how often um, that the society, especially these slaves who are now part of the body of Christ, they would feel worth less. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. how, how the gospel message would have been heard them that they have supreme worth. Mm -hmm. And that, that that was, I think you bring that out as well with the whole power and privilege. There is somebody now, if I'm a slave owner uh, and I come to faith, uh, it's, so I'm Phoebe, maybe Phoebe did have a, a slave, she was wealthy enough, it would have been something People just did at this time, right? But what does it mean for her to wash the feet of her slave? What does it mean that, and let's say that was a male slave that was helping in the, in the household and they now have a, a church meeting and she reads this letter and then what does she do afterwards? Does she serve the, does she serve him as they do communion? Does she wash his feet as they, I mean, I, I think that there's, as, as you start to kind of unpack it and think, how did they actually live this out? It gets really exciting and challenging and scary. So I think one of the strengths of Scott's book is he said, this is lived theology, that's right? right? That's right. I don't know if that's your phrase or not. It is. It is. It is. Charles Marsh. Yeah, Charles. I got it from Charles Marsh. Yeah, that, that, that this is lived theology. This is not just some abstract theology that you pull off a, off a shelf in your library, but this is something that you live every day. Mark ends his, his classes uh, at, at Champions Forest Baptist Church with a thing you call points for home. So I want to try to bring this down to say, what are our points from home for this? And particularly, I'd like to know, in our social setting today, who are the weak? Who are the strong? Who are those who are able? Who are those who are not able? I'll give you a minute to think about it. Because I think it's a profound question for us, if we're going to be reading this as lived theology, how do we do so 
given our social context, the people that we are. You want to take a stab at that first? Well, the Apology of Aristides, I think a second century text, describes what happens in a Christian household when a when the slave owner evangelizes a slave and the slave becomes a believer and says, they are now brothers. So let's, let's say that uh, Charles Marsh's brilliance with lived theology is he believes you can watch Christians live and you should be able to infer a theology from the life. Yeah. And that's what I was trying to capture in chapters 12 to 16. So I believe that eating with one another without argument, eating with one another and saying, you can eat as you will, I will eat as I will, and we will not let this separate us because we are siblings in Christ. And you will find on on my part that I will deny myself for your good because this is the way Christ was, and I do not want to be a stumbling block to you. All of a sudden now we have a dynamic that is almost sabotages all our senses of privilege and the way we divide from one another. What if we decided, I am going to behave with you in such a way that I will not cause you to stumble? What, am I, what are we going to do when we say, you know, I'm going to let you choose to live like that because you have to answer to the Lord. And I answer to the Lord. This is part of Paul's argument in Romans 14 to 15. It's scary because there's a lack of control on some of that. So I believe, uh, David, that I think one thing we can do is practice the virtue of eating with one another without argument in order to enjoy the siblingship that we have in Christosis. <laughs> so, you, so the Cubs, the Cubs I've fan, converted them, and the Astros fan. And I'm not sitting with any Astros. <laughs> I would say to the Astros that being behind two to nothing is nothing. We won a World Series after being behind two games. So w- there, there's still hope for us. There's plenty there's of still hope. plenty of hope there's for us. Hope. Anybody else want to say who are the weak? Who are the strong? Who are the able? Who are the unable? The weak and the strong will invariably, David, be contextualized. That's what I mean, in our yeah, context. Yeah, well, it, because our contexts differ. Uh, the strong in one context might be okay. the weak in another, and uh, vice versa. But it does seem to me that, um, once again, to return to where Scott has had us, in, in Romans 14, Paul says something so stunning to me. Um, None of us live to ourselves and none of us die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. And if we could begin to see the other uh, as one for whom Christ died, and if we begin to see the goal as greater conformity into his character and likeness, I wonder if we might not now take the message of Romans and make it live again. Mm -hmm. Uh, Historically, I was thinking here that um, one of the issues Paul's talking about is people that have different convictions. So immediately, if we're going to invoke John Barclay, he has an interesting essay on why we should all be vegetarians in light of uh, 1 Corinthians 8 to 10. In the sense of who are the strong and the weak there, uh, those that uh, he inverts the argument about those who have the um, resources so that we should live a different lifestyle now for those that don't have resources that are affected by climate change. But um, one of the things that struck me as I was thinking about this is that it's not strong and weak per se, always in a social setting, but it's those that have differing convictions about theological issues. And one of the issues that uh, marks out the Protestant tradition is divisiveness about theology. So if you look at the Roman Catholics or Eastern Orthodox, they have some sense of unity, whereas our drive towards uh, doctrinal purity is always, almost always a drive towards separation from those that are doctrinally different than us. 
And we do I stand there at what, 33,000 Protestant groups in the United States? Yeah, it's amazing when you, uh, when you think through this. And it's what, what does it mean for us then to be uh, a little bit more accepting? And, and in our postmodern context, tolerance is probably the, uh, one of the most prized values. And so I wouldn't want to pursue tolerance just uh, on that basis but a tolerance based on a common faith in Christ that would allow um, engagement with those that are reformed or not reformed or uh, Arminian or charismatic or not charismatic or uh, even when we come to issues about gender differences and um, uh, women in leadership and not and the, these things to where we have made them the absolutes of the gospel and Paul's calling us to say no. Jesus Christ is the gospel, not these issues that divide us. Mm -hmm. yeah. So. Liam? Yeah, I'm saying amen. Yeah, uh, I think so. I think it, it's a challenge for all of us to continue to go back to scripture and to search our heart and to make sure that our gospel is real simple. It's real deep, but it's also real simple. And we don't add on other things that then will be divisive. That's not easy. It's not because we have to live it out. Right, so we have to do something, either sprinkle or dunk. You know, we just we have to do it, mm -hmm. and so, uh, and it's good to have uh, an, an opinion or a con uh, having thought through what you're going to do. It's just making it uh, something on which you will break fellowship over. That's that's where I think Ben's word is so good. This is last question, maybe the most important of all. If you were stranded on a desert island. And you can only take one book of the Bible with you, and it's not Romans. Which book would you take, Ben? Oh, gosh. Um, Luke's Gospel. Or, Luke's Gospel. Yes. Why? Real quick, why? Uh, I'm a charismatic. Charismatic. Okay. He likes the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. It's all about the Spirit. There and Jesus together. Yeah. Now, <laughs> what is the, the condition is we're all alone on an island. You, you're on a desert island. Yeah. I've got the Gospels pretty much in my head. I'm taking the book of Psalms. Book of Psalms. Okay. Book of Psalms. Okay. Could be any book of the Bible. Book of Psalms. When, when is um, the boat coming by to pick me up? Like, how long <laughs> do I have? That? I don't know. It's Gilligan's Island. It could be yeah. any. It, it, it could, could be, be a long time. Well, if it's Gilligan's Island, though, can it might change up. I, yeah, because I don't know. Because I'm trying to think, do I do narrative like First, Second Samuel? Because I want to be there for a long time, and I like the mm. stories. Or do I want to do Philippians, which is my favorite epistle? Okay. I don't know. Depends so, on when the boat comes. Okay. Yeah. Depends on when the boat's coming, Todd? Oh, I, I'm going to pass. I don't know. <laughs> I, um, <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, Philippians. Philippians. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yes. Would you thank our panelists today? <laughs> Thank you.